Ah, oh, what's up, LG Bros and Broettes? We're doing math on the internet, so don't adjust your TV sets. Let's get linear. Today we're going to take a look at quadratic forms. At the start, we have some really nice theorems. The principal axis theorem says let A be an n, the principal axis theorem. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, at the start we're talking about quadratic forms. We have the principal axis theorem says let A be an n by n symmetric matrix. Then there is an orthogonal change of variable x equals p times y that transforms the quadratic equation x transpose times a times x into, there should be into y transpose times d times y, a quadratic form. So it changes x transpose times a times x, and I'll make a note here, into y transpose times d times y, which is a quadratic form with no cross product term. And we have a nice definition to start with. A quadratic form, capital Q, is a positive definite if Q of x is greater than 0 for all x not equal to 0, negative definite if Q of x is less than 0 for all x not equal to 0, indefinite if Q of x assumes both positive and negative values, positive semi-definite if Q of x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x not equal to 0, and negative semi-definite if q of x is less than or equal to 0 for all x not equal to 0. And we're actually going to be classifying our quadratic forms based on eigenvalues. So we have quadratic forms and eigenvalues. Let a be an n by n symmetric matrix. And then a quadratic form x transpose times a times x is positive definite if and only if the eigenvalues of a are all positive. Negative definite if and only if the eigenvalues of A are all negative, and indefinite if and only if A has positive and negative eigenvalues. Now, keep in mind, if we have positive eigenvalues and zero shows up, but nothing negative, then we would use that term from before, positive semi-definite. Or if we have no positive eigenvalues, but let's say the eigenvalues are negative and maybe zero. Remember, zero is signless. It's not negative or positive. And we could use that other term, negative semi-definite. So there's really five different categories that we could be talking about. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what today has to offer us. I want to compute the quadratic form x transpose times a times x when a is equal to this matrix here. And let's go ahead and we'll start. So I'm given these different vectors to use for x. We start with a very generic description. So here I can go ahead and build x transpose times a times x. And here, if this vector in R2 with entries x1 and x2 is my vector x, then the transpose of that would be a row vector with entries x1 and x2, and then times matrix A, which is given, so I can just rewrite that, of course, and then times classic x, which is this column vector in R2. And not a bad idea to consider sizes here. I'm going to want to multiply from left to right, so I'm going to start here on the left. And this is a 1 by 2 times a 2 by 2. And the result of this, whoops, <coughs> cut it off just a bit too soon. Set it, though. I think you need the playback. A 1 by 2 times, I said this was a 2 by 2, 2 by 2. And the result of this is going to give me a 1 by 2. So let's go ahead and we'll do this part first. So with my 1 by 2, I'm going to have... So think of the row column rule, x sub 1 times 5, which is 5x sub 1, and then plus x sub 2 times 1 third, which is 1 third x sub 2. And then for my second entry, I'm going to stay in my row from my row vector, but then move to the second column, x sub 1 times 1 third, so that's 1 third x sub 1, and then plus 1 times x sub 2, which is just plus x sub 2. So we have the two entries here. But I still have to multiply by vector x to finish this off. And now I have a, I'll write it down over here, now I have a 1 by 2 times a 2 by 1, and this is going to give me a 1 by 1. So 
is going to give me a one by one, which I wouldn't really write this as a matrix because it's just one single entry. So I'll just sort of write it as the entry that it is. I'm going to use my row column rule, and I'm going to get 5x sub 1 plus 1 third x sub 2 times x sub 1. And think about distributing in. It's going to give me 5x sub 1 squared plus 1 third x sub 1 x sub 2. Right? I'm multiplying this entry by this entry. And think about distributing x sub 1 in. And then plus, now second entry is I'm going to multiply. So 1 third x sub 1 plus x sub 2 quantity times x sub 2. And think about distributing in. That's going to give me 1 third x sub 1 x sub 2 plus x sub 2 times x sub 2 is x sub 2 squared. And I can go ahead and combine my like terms to get a final result here. It looks like I can combine these mixed variable terms. So I have 5x sub 1 squared. 1 third plus 1 third gives me 2 thirds x sub 1 x sub 2, and then plus x sub 2 squared. And this is going to be an important preliminary example because I want you to notice something interesting about the result that we got for x transpose times a times x relative to the matrix that we were given for a. Okay, I sort of have both of them in the frame. So my x sub 1 squared coefficient 5, I can see it here in the upper left. My coefficient on x sub 2 squared, which is really a 1, I can see it here in the bottom right. But then the coefficient on the mixed variable term for x1 and x2, which is 2 thirds, it gets split 1 third and 1 third for these entries here. So there's my 1 third and 1 third brings me to my 2 thirds. And we're going to talk more about this. Right now I just want you to notice visually or aesthetically what's happening. So that's what's sort of going on there. And we have a couple computational examples. Switch colors for those. I have the vector 6, 1, and I want to compute x transpose times a times x. So vector x is the vector 6, 1, and then x transpose would be the row vector 6, 1. And then our vector, I'm sorry, our matrix A was 5, 1, 3rd, 1, 3rd, 1. Notice it's a symmetric matrix, too. We can multiply this out. So again, I want to start with the first two pieces. So I'm going to get 6 times 5 gives me 30, plus 1 times 1 third is 1 third, and that's my first entry. And then still with the row column rule, but switching columns here of matrix A, 6 times 1 third gives me 2, plus 1 times 1 gives me 1. And I still have to multiply by my column vector 6, 1. And here, I sort of, you know, I could add 2 plus 1, and I'll do that. I'll think about it at least. But here, it's not such a bad idea to leave this as 30 plus 1 thirds, because when I go to multiply, and here multiplying the first entries and then the second entries and adding, 30 plus 1 third times 6, I can sort of think about distributing, right? 30 times 6 is going to give me 180, plus 6 times 1 third is going to give me 2. And that's the first entry. And then I'm adding to this, this is 2 plus 1 times 1, or that's 3 times 1, which is really 3. So it makes the arithmetic, I think, a little bit nicer. But 180 plus 2 plus 3 gives me 185 for the result there. So I can circle this answer as well. I didn't circle it before, but I'll circle it now. And one more computational example, it looks like, with the vector 1, 3. Right, 1, 3 for x transpose times a times x. So vector x is the vector 1, 3 is a column vector. So x transpose is the row vector 1, 3. And then matrix A, I can cheat. And remember, it was 5, 1, 3rd, 1, 3rd, 1. And then I want to multiply these together. So first, we do our row column rule, and we get a couple of entries. So I'm going to get 1 times 5 is 5, plus 3 times 1, 3rd is 1. And then for my second entry, I'm going to get 1 times 1, 3rd is 1, 3rd, plus 3 times 1 is 3. But I still have to multiply by vector x. And remember, the result of multiplying these together, right, which is a 1 by 2 times a 2 by 1, is going to give me a 1 by 1, which is just a single entry. So no more need for any brackets or array or matrices. A 5 plus 1 is 6. So 6 times 1 gives me 6. Plus, and then here I didn't combine these, but it's all, all for the better, right? Because 1 third plus 3 quantity times 3. I'm going to get 3 times 1 third, think about distributing, 3 times 1 third gives me 1, 
plus 3 times 3 gives me 9. I can add these together. So 9 and 1 is 10, 10 and 6 gives me 16. So these nice computational examples. But I want you to think back to the relationship that this x transpose times a times x gave us for this abstract result relative to the matrix that we had. Right? We, had we saw our coefficients for x1 and x2 squared, x1 squared and x2 squared, were present here in sort of the uh, along the main diagonal. <clears throat> and that mixed variable term, its coefficient 2 thirds was split everywhere else. And we're going to actually take a look at going in the opposite direction now, which actually isn't going to be so bad. And there's um, some ideas that I want to present here. But I want to find the matrix of the quadratic form and assume that x is in R2. Now we're going to be building symmetric matrices. So let's just talk about a generic 2 by 2 matrix. And I'm going to go ahead and label. I'll do this in a different color. Let's get the purple. And labeling along the top, we'll say, well, this is where x1 should go, and then this is where x2 should go. And then down the side, this is where x1 would be, and this is where x2 would be. So if I go and sort of crosshair the entries, this very first upper left entry would be x1 by x1, which is for x1 squared. And then here, if I finish that row, this would be x1 by x2, which is x1, x2. But now here in the bottom left, this is also x1 by x2. So I have another spot where x1 by x2 lives. And then here in the bottom right, that's x2 by x2, which is x2 squared. So it's giving me an idea as to how I can write in these values. And I really just want to write in the coefficients. I want numerical matrices. And we'll talk about how to do this as we're going through and doing it. We'll see a few examples, and I think you'll really start <clears throat> to get an idea as to how we want to build this. So I want to build a 2 by 2 matrix. And my quadratic form is 10x1 squared, minus 6x1, x2, and minus 3x2 squared. Now, the coefficient on x1 squared should just go in this upper left corner. So that's 10x1 squared. That 10 should go right there, upper left. And then finishing that main diagonal, I have this negative 3x2 squared. And that coefficient on x2 squared should go right here in the bottom right. So that negative 3 goes right there. Now the only thing that's left are the spots for x1 and x2. And I want this to be a symmetric matrix. So to make sure that it's a symmetric matrix, we have to split. We have to split the coefficient into those two different entries. So we need to split evenly, I should say, the coefficient on x1, x2. So it's a negative 6 right now, but if I cut it in half, it's a negative 3. So I want in my x1, x2 positions, I want to split it evenly. All right, we're sharing. So negative 3 and negative 3. And this makes up the negative 6, x1, x2. <clears throat> so this is how I would build this matrix, this symmetric matrix, which we can call A. Hey, Maybe it's a little bit strange. Let's see another example. And again, we're assuming we're in R2. So a 2 by 2 matrix. I have a 5x1 squared. Remember, x1 squared's coefficient goes right here in the upper left. So that's where I want to put the 5. But then I'm missing x2 squared. I'm missing x2 squared. So what should go where x2 squared's entry should be? Well, that would have to be a 0. It would have to be a 0x2 squared since it's missing. But then remember, for the coefficient on x1, x2, I want to split it evenly for these entries that aren't on the main diagonal. I want to make sure it's a symmetric matrix. So if it was a 3, i got to cut it in half. i got to share it. So it's got to be a 3 halves and a 3 halves. So there's my 5x1 squared. There's my missing 0x2 squared. And summing these two... I get a 3 halves x1, x2 plus another 3 halves x1, x2 is going to build that 3 x1, x2. So let me know if this makes sense in the comment section below. We're going to see a couple more examples. And we're going to do some more examples in some context, some greater context with other problems. But now we're going to kick it up a notch. And we're going to talk about R3. It's now a 3 by 3 matrix. Let me go ahead and label hmm, some purple. So here along the top for a 3x3 three three matrix, x1, x2, x3, and then down the side, x1, 
x2, x3. Let me switch colors so it looks a little bit nicer, I think. Now here in the very upper left, so, so we're, we're going to go across the main diagonal. I got x1 by x1 is x1 squared. Right in the middle, right in the middle, I have x2 by x2, so that's x2 squared. And then here in that bottom right corner, I have x3 by x3, which is x sub 3 squared. And let's go ahead and fill in the rest. And I'm really just cross hairing here. So here, if I'm finishing this top row, I have x1 by x2. And then right to the right of that, I have x1 by x3. And now if I'm going to the second row and filling this out, first I have x1 by x2. And then I already have the middle, but then the very last entry, that's x2 by x3. And now filling this last row in, first I have x1 by x3. Then I'm going to have x2 by x3. And then we have the x3 squared. And this is going to give us an idea. So our coefficients for x1, x2, and x3 are going to go right here on the main diagonal. Then I want you to notice, and I can color code this a bit, that the x1, x2 entries are going to be split evenly here and here. What else do we got? Green. I have the x1, x3 entries go in the far corners, not on the main diagonal. Got one more color for you, that red. And then the x2, x3 entries, you can find those here. And this is going to build a nice symmetric matrix for us when we're splitting those evenly. Now let's get some practice. Let's see what's going on here. So let's build our symmetric matrix A. It's a 3 by 3. I have an 8x1 squared. So 8 goes right there, upper left, main diagonal. Filling out that main diagonal first, next I have a 7x2 squared. So 7 goes right in the middle for our x2 squared. And then I have a negative 3x3 squared, so negative 3 goes right there in the bottom corner. But now I want to split the x1 by x2 terms here. And actually, let me color code this because I have them circled in blue. Let's do the baby blue. So it's a negative 6x1, x2. Cut it in half. Split it. We're sharing. Negative 3, negative 3. But what about the x1 by x3 that was in the green? x1, x3's coefficient is a 4. i got to split it in half. i got to share it. That's going to be a 2 and a 2. Cut it in half. 2 and a 2. And the red's going to really pop, I think. The x2, x3 terms are all that's left. Its coefficient is a negative 2. Cut it in half. we got to split it. That's a negative 1 and a negative 1. And this is my symmetric matrix, capital A. Not too bad, right? Hopefully. We'll take a look at one more example working in R3, and then we got some other stuff to talk about. So a 3 by 3 matrix. Notice I only have the cross product terms. I only have the mixed variable terms. I don't have any x1 squared, so it's got to be a 0x1 squared. I don't have any x2 squared term, so it's got to be a 0 for that as well. And I don't have any x3 squared term. It's got to be a 0 for that as well. But I do have my x1, x2 term, and that's got a coefficient of 4. We've got to split it in half. x1, x2 should live here and here. Splitting 4 in half, that's got to be 2 and 2. Next, I do have a coefficient on x1, x3. It's a 6. Got to cut it in half. 6 divided by 2 gives me 3. It should be 3 and 3, and this is my x1, x3 spots. And just leaving me with my spots for x2, x3. Its coefficient is a negative 8. You know, cut it in half. So negative 4, negative 4. And there is my wonderful symmetric matrix that represents this quadratic form. So not so bad, right? Very nice. So OK, so let's talk about this. Because now I can use this in combination with our orthogonal diagonalization. I want to classify the quadratic form that I have and make a change of variable x equals p times y that transforms the quadratic form into a new quadratic form with no cross product term. And then I want to write the new quadratic form out. Let's go ahead and start just by building that symmetric matrix. We had a lot of practice doing this. This is in R2. We're going to assume we're in R2. So we should be able to do this. So I have my 3x1 squared. So 3 goes here in the upper left. 
can look at the very end and see I have a 6x2 squared, so 6 goes on that main diagonal as well. But then my x1, x2 term, it's got a coefficient of negative 4. Cut it in half. That's negative 2 and negative 2. And this is my symmetric matrix A. Now from here, we're going to do orthogonal diagonalization. So it should be very familiar to us from the previous lecture. I want A minus lambda I. So I subtract lambda on the main diagonal. And let's find the determinant of this puppy. Determinant of A minus lambda I. So that's 3 minus lambda times 6 minus lambda. And then minus negative 2 times negative 2 gives me 4. Set that determinant equal to 0. Let's go ahead and expand this out. So negative lambda times negative lambda gives me positive lambda squared. Negative 6 lambda minus 3 lambda is going to give me negative 9 lambda. 3 times 6 gives me 18, but then 18 minus 4 is going to give me 14. And equals 0. And if I can factor this, I want to factor it. Hey, I can factor it, so let's factor. This is going to be lambda minus 7, lambda minus 2. So multiply to that positive 14 and add to the negative 9, which gives me two eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are positive 7 and positive 2. Now I can now classify this. My eigenvalues are both positive, which means the quadratic form, quadratic form is positive definite. Positive definite, since both eigenvalues are positive and not zero. They're both positive. So the quadratic form is positive definite. That's how we classify this. So, okay, so that was a pit stop that maybe we weren't used to, the classification, but now it's back to what we were doing in the previous lectures. I want to now work with the eigenvalues and build my eigenvectors. Let's start with lambda equals 7. And the order that you work with them doesn't matter. I like to work with the largest eigenvalue first. I encourage you to do that too. I'm not going to fight you over it. Plugging in for lambda, 3 minus 7 gives me negative 4. And then we have negative 2, and I want to augment with the 0 vector. And then negative 2. And then 6 minus lambda, 6 minus 7 is going to give me negative 1, augmented with 0. And now I can row reduce and find my eigenvector. So here, let me go ahead and I'll do a negative 1 half row 1, and I'll do a negative row 2, and these now these rows are going to be identical. They're both going to be 2, 1, augmented with 0. And I can eliminate row 2 by replacing that with row 2 minus row 1. So 2, 1, augmented with 0, and then my row of all zeros at the bottom. And now let's build a vector from this. So what is this remaining non-zero row saying? It's saying, well, 2v1 plus v2 is equal to 0, or that v2 is equal to negative 2v1. So when I go to build my vector v with entries v1 and v2, I can go ahead and pick some nice values to build the numerical vector. I'm going to say, let's let v1 be 1. So if v1 is 1, then v1 is 1. And v2 is negative 2 times that. Negative 2 times 1 gives me negative 2. Now, we want to make this into a unit vector, so don't forget, we want to find the magnitude of vector v. It's going to be the square root of you know, 1 squared plus negative 2 squared. So square root of 1 plus 4 gives me square root of 5. So then this as a unit vector, as a unit vector, is going to give me the vector 1 over square root 5, negative 2 over square root 5. And it's still an eigenvector. So now a unit eigenvector, which I think is great. That's what we want for our orthogonal diagonalization, of course, with our principal axis theorem. As a consolation, we get to do this again with the other eigenvalue, lambda equals 2. Let's build that system and solve it. So lambda equals 2, we're plugging in. I get 3 minus 2 is 1 and then negative 2, and then we have negative 2, and then 6 minus 2 is 4, so negative 2 and then 4. And these rows look dependent. Um, 
scale if you want. I may just do a row replacement. I could say, well, let me replace row two with row two plus two times row one. We all know what that's gonna do. Negative two plus two times one gives me zero. Four plus two times negative two is four. Minus four gives me zero. Zero plus two times zero gives me zero. So that was fast. And here, what am I left with to work with? Well, I have v1 minus 2v2 equals 0, or v1 equals 2v2. Let's build our vector. Let's v as n trees v1, v2. Let's let v2 be 1, and then v1 is 2 times 1 gives me 2. But I want this to be a unit vector, so let's find the magnitude of vector v, which is the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, which is going to give me the square root of 4 plus 1, gives me the square root of 5. And I want to scale by that. So my unit vector for this pink vector v should be 2 over square root of 5, 1 over square root 5. Yeah, still an eigenvector, unit vector now. And these are orthogonal vectors. I can get them both in the frame here. If we find their dot product between the blue unit vector and the pink unit vector, dot product is 0. So we're doing the orthogonal diagonalization. Now we really have the pieces that we need to write out our responses. I want to build matrices P and D. So here matrix P is going to have these eigenvectors as column vectors. And my first eigenvector in the baby blue was one over radical five, negative two over radical five. My second eigenvector, as a column vector was 2 over square root 5, 1 over square root 5. And now I need to build my diagonal matrix capital D. And remember, this has to be respective. So it's a diagonal matrix. So just everything that isn't on the main diagonal has to be a 0. And then the entries that are on the main diagonal, they could be 0, they could be non-zero. They're determined by the eigenvalue. And those eigenvalues need to be respective to how we built the columns of P. This first column of P didn't just make it up on the drive-in. That was my eigenvector. That eigenvector came from eigenvalue 7. So in this first column of D, in the diagonal entry for it, I need that eigenvalue 7. That same idea. Second column of P came from this pink eigenvector that came from eigenvalue 2. So the second column of diagonal matrix D in its diagonal entry needs that eigenvalue 2. And this is going to do our orthogonal diagonalization. There is but one step left to consider, and that is to write the new quadratic form with no cross product term. And that is making a substitution x equals p times y. Now, we're talking about the quadratic form x transpose times a times x. And we started with this first example talking about this and exploring it a bit computationally, but that's where we get this original quadratic form from, x transpose times a times x, and we go back to find matrix A, and we go through all these computations. So hopefully everything's kind of connecting a bit from that first example. The first example seemed like it was just computational, but it sort of plants the seed of what we're talking about now. This is x transpose times a times x, in a quadratic form, if we know how to work backwards, like those examples we saw, we can build matrix A like we did. And now I want to make a substitution, letting x be equal to p times y. So if I make that substitution, then this is going to become, instead of x transpose, it's py transpose times A times, instead of x, it's p times y. Now, a product being transposed is the product of the transposes in the reverse order. So py transpose is the same as y transpose p transpose times a times p times y. And now we're going to get a really nice result. Let's go back to when we talked about diagonalization. We have a is equal to pdp inverse. And if I solve this for matrix D, now I'm going to spare you sort of the details here so we can go through it a bit quicker. But if I solve for matrix D, what am I going to do? I'm going to multiply by p inverse on the left. So p inverse times p gives me the identity and goes away with multiplication. But over here I get p inverse on the left times a. And then I got to multiply by p on the right. So then here, p on the right. And p inverse times p is the identity as well. 
So I get D is equal to P inverse times A times P. And you want to show the work. Multiply by P inverse on the left. Multiply by P on the right. The identities are going to simplify. And you're just going to be isolating then. Diagonal matrix D is P inverse times A times P. But we can say the following. If P is an orthogonal matrix, then P inverse is the same as P's transpose. So for an orthogonal matrix P, D, diagonal matrix D, is P transpose times A times P, which, hey, it's right there. So making this clever substitution, I'm going to get this new form, Y transpose times D times Y. Now, there's actually a fast way to the answer after this justification, but let me show you, let me show you the actual steps of it. So here we're going to say, let's let, let's let vector y be an arbitrary vector in R2 with entries y1, y2. No different than how x was a column vector with entries x1 and x2. But now y transpose times d times y is going to look as follows. There's y. Over here in the front, y transpose is this row vector. And then matrix D was this matrix, 7002, I believe. Let's double check because my memory's not great. Yeah, 7002. If I multiply this out, it's going to be really nice. It's going to be y1 times 7 plus 0 times y2, so that's 7y1. And then 0 times y1 plus 2 times y2 gives me 2y2. Those are my two entries. And then times vector y. And now I multiply these together, but it just gives me a 1 by 1. So 7y1 times y1 gives me 7y1 squared plus 2y2 times y2 gives me 2y2 squared. And this is my new quadratic form. With no cross product term. I don't have y1, y2 terms, so this is very nice to work with, very nice to manipulate and think about. And what I'm really doing is sort of shifting the axis so that I can eliminate those cross product terms in a very cool way. But it makes sense if you think about it. I could actually go to this diagonal matrix D and just use the same mentality that we've been doing to build these symmetric matrices and think, okay, so now if I'm thinking in terms of y1 and y2, I got a 7y1 squared. I got a 2y2 two squared, and then my cross product terms, the y1, y2 terms, both have coefficients of 0. So summing that, 0 plus 0 gives me 0. So I have a 0, y1, y2. So I'm really missing it. But that's the point. I want to eliminate it. So yeah. We're going to go back. We're going to talk a little bit more about this stuff. So I do have this blank piece of paper that I'm going to come back to. But let's see a few examples, a couple more before we, we go back to that. Same idea. I want to classify my quadratic form. I want to make my change a variable, x equals p times y. I want to transform my quadratic form into a new one with no cross product term, and I want to write that new quadratic form. Let's build our matrix A to start. So I got a 2x1 squared. I got a 2x2 squared. And then splitting my cross product terms coefficient, which is a 10, so x1, x2, I got to split at 5 and 5. We want a minus lambda i, so subtracting lambda on the main diagonal. And now I can find the determinant of this matrix. So the determinant of a minus lambda i is going to be 2 minus lambda times 2 minus lambda, and then minus 5 times 5 gives me 25 equals 0. Expand this out. Negative lambda times negative lambda is a positive lambda squared. Negative 2 lambda minus 2 lambda is negative 4 lambda. 2 times 2 gives me 4, but then 4 minus 25 gives me negative 21 equals to 0. Hey, if you can factor this, you want to factor this. This is going to factor giving me, looks like it's going to be lambda minus 7, lambda plus 3 is the winning factoring. And then we're going to get our eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues are lambda equals positive 7 and lambda equals negative 3. But notice I have one eigenvalue that's positive and one eigenvalue that's negative. And this means the quadratic form 
is indefinite. Indefinite. Since the eigenvalues are both positive and negative, so the quadratic form, we define it as indefinite. We took a look at those on the very first page. So if you want to remember where these classifications come from, go back to that first page that we were talking about with our theorems. From there, and that's sort of new for us, the classification, we go back to working with the eigenvalues. So let's work with lambda equals 7 first. Let's build our system. So we have when lambda is 7, 2 minus 7 is going to give me negative 5, and then 5. And then here in the second row, I can look up here, that's 5, and then 2 minus 7 is negative 5. So not really a lot going on here. should be pretty quick to reduce this. I'm going to do a negative 1 fifth row 1 scaling it, and then a 1 fifth row 2 scaling it. So both of these rows are going to become identical, 1 negative 1 augmented with 0 for both. And then I can eliminate row 2, replacing with row 2 minus row 1. And that's going to give me a row of all zeros. And this is going to give me one of my favorite eigenvectors, because what is this telling me? It's telling me v1 minus v2 equals 0, or that v1 equals v2. Now when building my vector, I say, well, let me just let v1 be 1, and v2 is the same, so that's also 1. And if I want to get this as a unit vector, and I do, then we would say, okay, square root of, I want 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is going to give me square root of 1 plus 1 gives me square root of 2. So as a unit vector, my unit eigenvector is 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. Not so bad. Let's build the other unit eigenvector working with eigenvalue lambda equals negative 3. Yeah, let's work with that one now. How does that sound? Pretty good, right? If lambda is negative 3, 2 minus negative 3 gives me 5. 5, 5 augmented with 0, and then I got 5 again, and then I got another. 2 minus negative 3 is 2 plus 3 gives me 5. So everything's all 5'd up. And I'm going to scale. I like to scale. If you like to scale, let me know. I get 1, 1 augmented with 0. Not when I'm finding determinants, though. But we're reducing it. So everything is 1, 1 augmented with 0 for both rows. And I can eliminate row 2 with row 2 minus row 1, giving me a row of zeros down there. And what is this telling me? Well, the remaining row is telling me that v1 plus v2 is equal to 0, or that v2 is equal to negative v1. And I can build a vector from this. I say, well, let's let v1 be positive 1, and v2 is the opposite of that, so that should be negative 1. And again, I want this as a unit vector. So the magnitude of this purple vector v is the square root of 1 squared plus negative 1 squared which is square root of 1 plus 1, which gives me square root of 2. So as a unit eigenvector, it's going to be 1 over square root 2 and negative 1 over square root 2. So there we have it. Now from this, I can go ahead and build the results. So I want my orthogonal matrix P. And the first column of that should be my blue unit eigenvector, 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. The second column of it should be my purple unit eigenvector, which was 1 over square root 2, negative 1 over square root 2. And I'm also going to want to build my diagonal matrix, capital D. And it is a diagonal matrix, so I already know I got some zeros that are off the main diagonal. But on the main diagonal, I have to be careful. I need the eigenvalues that correspond respectively to how I built the columns of P. So that first column of P was built off of the eigenvalue 7. So you know what to do with that 7 there. Second column of orthogonal matrix P, that eigenvector came from eigenvalue negative 3. So we adjust that accordingly. 
Now I want to write the new quadratic form. Now just looking at this diagonal matrix D, I can say what that new quadratic form is. We talked about how we can compute this literally with y transpose times d times y. But if you followed our logic there, the new quadratic form can be achieved pretty quickly now. New quadratic form, I'll say, I'll give it a shout out, given by y transpose times d times y is, it's going to be seven y1 squared minus three y2 squared. And we can look at this diagonal matrix D and see where it comes from. Seven y1 squared, negative three y2 squared. That's that new quadratic form with no cross product terms. Really cool, very good, very nice. We'll take a look at one more example and then we'll talk a little bit more about how that change of variable is working. So same type of example, just a third example. We're really getting a lot of good practice in here. I wanna classify the quadratic form, make a change of variable x equals p times y. And I want to write the new quadratic form with no cross product term. Let's build that matrix A. X1 squared, that's a one x1 squared, so one in the upper left. I have a nine x2 squared, so nine in the bottom right. And remember for that x1, x2 terms coefficient, I have to split. So that's gonna be negative three and negative three. And let's build a minus lambda i. So one minus lambda, nine minus lambda, negative three and negative three. And let's find the determinant of this, determinant of a minus lambda i. It's going to be 1 minus lambda times 9 minus lambda, and then minus negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Let's set that determinant equal to 0, trying to get those non-trivial solutions to pop out. Negative lambda times negative lambda is a positive lambda squared. I get negative 9 lambda minus lambda. Let me write that out. I want to show you what's going to happen. Then I get 9 times 1 is 9, but then I have minus 9. Ah. So lambda squared minus 10 lambda, and then my constant terms, they just yeet on out of there, they cancel. So what am I gonna do now? Well, let's factor this. I can factor by just by factoring out a lambda, and I'm left with lambda minus 10, which gives me two eigenvalues. I get lambda equals positive 10 for one of them. And for the other, what's that gonna give me? It's gonna give me lambda equals zero. Now, for classifying this, we're going to use one of those sort of offbeat terms. My eigenvalues are positive and zero, so they're not negative, but I can't really say that they're both positive. One is positive and one is without sign, right? So they're non-negative, we would say. But the way we classify this is, say, the quadratic form is, we would say, positive semi-definite. Since zero isn't really positive, but it isn't negative, we use the term positive semi-definite to classify this quadratic form. And once we've classified it, it's time for some eigenvectors. Let's start with lambda equals 10. I should say unit eigenvectors. That's what we're here for. You know, you know what we're doing. When lambda is 10, plug it in. 1 minus 10 gives me negative 9, and then negative 3, and then negative 3. Remember, we got symmetric matrices that we're working with. And then 9 minus 10 gives me negative 1. And hey, I can scale these rows. I'm going to do a negative 1 third row 1 and a negative row 2. I don't like fractions. And both of these rows are going to become 3, 1, augmented with 0. So they're identical now, which means that I can eliminate row two, replacing with row two minus row one. It's gonna give me zero for row two, all zeros. And what am I left with? I'm left with that first row, it's three V1 plus V2 equals zero, or that V2 equals negative three V1. I can build a vector from this. Let V1 be one. V2 is negative three times that. 
will be 2 is negative 3. And let's get a unit vector out of this. So square root of 1 squared plus negative 3 squared. So square root of 1 plus 9 gives me square root of 10. So then as a unit vector, transforming my eigenvector to a unit eigenvector, I'm going to get 1 over square root 10 and negative 3 over square root 10. Let's work with the next eigenvalue. Now I remember that eigenvalue was 0, which really means that a minus lambda i, since lambda is 0, is really just going to produce matrix A for my coefficient matrix again. right? 1 minus 0 is 1, 9 minus 0 is 9. So I'm just going to get matrix A back out, which is 1, negative 3, negative 3, 9. And this is going to have some non-trivial solution to this homogeneous matrix equation. I go ahead and row reduce. I could replace row 2 with row 2 plus 3 times row 1. It will get me there very quickly. So negative 3 plus 3 times 1 gives me 0. 9 plus 3 times negative 3 gives me 0. And 0 plus 3 times 0 gives me 0. And then what is this telling me? Well, the remaining row says v1 minus 3v2 is equal to 0 or that v1 equals 3 times v2, and building my vector, we'll say let's let v2 be 1. v1 is 3 times that, so I get vector 3, 1. And you, and you know it's got to be a unit vector, so find the length, norm, or magnitude of this vector. Square root of 3 squared plus 1 squared gives me square root of 9 plus 1, gives me square root of 10. I can go ahead and then scale this so we get a unit vector for the eigenvector now in the same direction. That's 3 over square root 10 and 1 over square root 10. Now we're ready for the finishing touches on the problem, and then we're going to go back and have one last bit of discussion. Because now I can build my orthogonal matrix, capital P. My first column vector of p should be my first unit eigenvector in the baby blue, 1 over radical 10, negative 3 over radical 10 for that column vector. My second column of orthogonal matrix p should be my pink eigenvector as a unit vector. That's 3 over radical 10, 1 over radical 10. Notice these are orthogonal vectors, and they're unit vectors. And then I want to build diagonal matrix d. setting up for the diagonal matrix, but now i got to use my eigenvalues respectively. My first unit eigenvector building my first column of orthogonal matrix P came from the eigenvalue 10. So then in column 1 of diagonal matrix D, the diagonal entry of that should be 10. You know, you know it. The second column vector of orthogonal matrix P, my pink unit eigenvector, came from eigenvalue 0. So in the second column of diagonal matrix D, the diagonal entry should be that eigenvalue, which was 0. So there's my diagonal matrix D. Now writing this new quadratic form, so the new and improved quadratic form given by y transpose times d times y is you can sort of look at the diagonal matrix to figure out what it is. It's 10y1 squared plus 0y2 squared. You write it that way first, though. We're not going to leave it that way. No, no, no. Just so you can see what the eigenvalues are doing. And that, we would really write it as 10y1 squared. Now, if you have something that is semi-definite in like R2, something like that, I would say... Use the zero eigenvalue last to build out your diagonal matrix D. And that's just an aesthetic thing. I could have I could have swapped the columns of P, and I could have then swapped diagonal entries on diagonal matrix D, but I think it would look a little bit funny to write the new quadratic form as 0y1 squared plus 10y2 squared. There's no real harm in that. But it would be really weird to say, well, my new quadratic form is 10y2 squared, because you'd be thinking, well, what happened to y1 squared? Is it the end of the world? No. 
but I think this just looks a little bit nicer. It looks a little bit less confusing. And since it's without a loss of generality, this would be my preference. If it was negative semi-definite and I had um, a negative eigenvalue and a zero eigenvalue, I would still want that non-zero eigenvalue to present first. And again, that's just my preference. I'm just, I'm talking to you. I'm telling you what I like. Hopefully you like it too. But there we have our new quadratic form. Let's go back to the very first example and talk a little bit more about what this change of variable is doing, like I wanted to. So our, our change of variable is x equals p times y, and we're revisiting the first question we did. Now x is a column vector, x1, x2. And we're saying let x be equal to p times y. We've built this matrix p, and I'm gonna let y be that column vector y1, y2, like we said earlier. But let's go back to this first example. This was our positive definite example. What was matrix P? Matrix P was one over radical five, negative two over radical five was the first column. And the second column was two over radical five, one over radical five. And if I go to actually multiply this out, what is this gonna give me? Well, this is a two by two times a two by one is gonna give me a two by one. I'm gonna make it kind of look a little bit fatter though. I get one over radical five times y one plus two over radical five times y two. And then for the second entry, I'm gonna get negative two over radical five y one plus one over radical five y two. And these are literally substitutions that we're making. So if I look at the far ends, what we're saying is we're letting x1 be equal to one over radical five y1 plus two over radical five y2. And we're letting x2 be equal to negative two over radical five y1 plus one over radical five y2. And these are the substitutions that will transform the original quadratic form into the new quadratic form with no cross product term. That quadratic form was 3x1 squared. So 3x1 squared. And then minus 4x1, x2. And then what was it? Plus 6x2 squared, I think. Let me double check. Yeah, 3 minus 4, 6. But now we're going to actually make these substitutions. So three and then x1 squared, x1 is one over radical five y1 plus two over radical five y2 and we're squaring it minus four times x1 times x2. So one over radical five y1 plus two over radical five y2 times x2 is negative two over radical five y1 plus one over radical five y2 and then plus six times x2 squared x2 we're replacing with negative two over radical five y one plus one over radical five y two. Expand this all out. Just a lot of multiplying. <clears throat> so here I have three times. If I FOIL this, one over radical five y one times one over radical five y one gives me one fifth y one squared. Two over radical five y two times itself gives me four over five y two squared. And then when I multiply the outer and the inner terms together, I'm really doubling so it's one times two is two over radical five times radical five is five. So two over five, but I got to double it because I have the outer and the inner is going to give me a total of four over five y1, y2. Then I have minus four times, let me FOIL this out, one over radical five times negative two over radical five gives me negative two over five y1 squared. Two over radical five times one over radical five gives me two over five, that's y2 squared. And then for the outer and inner terms, one over radical five times one over radical five, y one, y two is a one fifth y one, y two. I'll write that out. And then negative two times two gives me a negative four over five, y one, y two. I can combine those later. And I still have this stuff, so let me do plus six times negative two over radical five times itself gives me four over five, that's y one squared. 1 over radical 5 times 1 over radical 5 is 1 over 5. That's y2 squared. 
and then here the outer and inner terms negative 2 times 1 is negative 2 over 5 but I got to double it so that's negative 4 over 5 combining outer and inner terms y1 y2 just a lot of algebra okay for linear algebra sounds good so let's go ahead and now see what we can do with this if I go ahead and start distributing the 3 in so then I'm gonna have 3 times 1 fifth. Let me switch colors though because it's starting to get a lot of yellow. Let me know if you think that's a good move. Do something like pink. I get 3 fifths y1 squared plus 3 times 4 is 12 fifths y2 squared plus another 12 fifths, but that's y1, y2. And then bringing the minus 4 in, minus a negative is going to be plus 8 fifths y1 squared. And then minus 4 times 2 is a minus 8 fifths y2 squared. And then I didn't combine these, but this is really a negative 3 fifths y1, y2. If I combine these two terms, multiplying it by a negative 4 gives me plus 12 fifths y1, y2. And now let's bring the 6 in. So 6 times 4 fifths is going to give me 24 fifths y1 squared. 6 times 1 fifth is going to give me 6 fifths y2 squared. And 6 times negative 4 fifths is going to give me negative 24 fifths y1, y2. Oh boy. Combine like terms. What do I have on y1 squared? 3 fifths y1 squared plus 8 fifths y1 squared plus 24 fifths y1 squared. I think that's it. Let's go ahead and add them together. So we'll say, okay, um, 24 and 8. So that's going to give me 24 and 4 is going to give me 28. And then 28 and 4 is going to give me 32. 32 plus 3 is going to give me 35 fifths y1 squared. Yes. How about y2 squared? Yeah. 12 fifths y2 squared minus 8 fifths y2 squared plus 6 fifths y2 squared. Careful not to cut up any signs. 12 fifths minus 8 fifths is going to give me 4 fifths plus 6 fifths is going to give me 10 fifths y2 squared. And then everything else is a mixed variable term. 12 fifths y1, y2 plus 12 fifths y1, y2 gives me 24 fifths y1, y2. But then I'm subtracting 24 fifths y1, y2. So that cancels, making 0 y1, y2, which eliminates that cross product term. So I'm just left with 35 fifths y1 squared plus 10 fifths y2 squared, which we know we can reduce this. So this is going to give me a 7 y1 squared plus 2 y2 squared. So here I get that same quadratic form through the literal substitutions. And those substitutions they literally come from writing x equals p times y, showed the work up here, and we get these two substitutions separately for x1 and x2. Now, let's see if I have any time to give a little bit of a, a visual justification just in this little corner here. I want to leave you with something visual for you visual learners. But let's say I had, I'll do this in red because I got the red, let's say I had probably mess this up but let's say I have some um, lips and these are my usual grids on x1 and x2 spatially it doesn't really fit very perfectly but when I build these new axes with my principal axes theorem I'm actually getting perfect axes for the ellipse something like this and just trying to eyeball it and this would be my y1 and y2 axes that eliminate the cross product terms this isn't really the best visualization 
um, you know, you can shoot me an email, I'll send you maybe some better ideas as to how this could look. But the idea is I'm really trying to shift how I'm thinking about the orientation of my space, how I'm thinking about these axes so that everything lies really nicely. And if I just focus on the red axes, the way it cuts through the ellipse is not exactly so nice looking. The way that the, the red axes cut through the ellipse isn't really very nice. But if I sort of think about, well, the green ones cut through almost perfectly. It looks like everything's lined up really nicely. So hey, just giving you some rough idea there. I hope this helps. I hope it isn't harmful to you. Let me know in the comment section below, helpful or harmful, and what do you think about quadratic forms? But otherwise, no matter where you are and what you're doing, I want to encourage you to always keep learning, keep dreaming, and to follow your heart. And hey, we're not going anywhere. We'll still be doing more math with cats, and I will see you next time. Until then, take care.